país. Eh, tendremos eh, esta tarde el placer de escuchar eh, las reflexiones del profesor Neil Lederman, premio Nobel de Física 1988, como ustedes todos conocen, acerca de eh, un tema al cual le está dedicando él considerable parte de su tiempo durante los últimos años, que es la construcción de capacidades, no desde el punto de vista de capacidades materiales, sino las más importantes que son las capacidades intelectuales. Es decir, el tema está relacionado con la enseñanza de la ciencia. Vamos a darle la palabra al doctor Víctor Fajer, presidente de la Sociedad Cubana de Física, para que haga la presentación de nuestro visitante en inglés a partir de ahora. Buenas tardes. Entonces, a continuación, vamos a presentar al profesor Leo Lederman. He was born in New York on July 15, 1922, of immigrant parents. He received his PhD in 1951 at Columbia University. He became director of the Navy's laboratory in 1961. During his academic career at Columbia University, 1951-1979, he has had 50 PhD students, 14 are professor of physics. In 1979, he became director of the Fermi Lab, where he supervised the construction and utilization of the first superconducting cyclotron, now the highest energy accelerator in the world. In 1988, he obtained the Nobel Prize in physics due to the discovery of the two kinds of neutrino and other results connected to elementary particle physics. He has been increasingly involved in development via scientific collaboration with science education for gifted children and with public understanding of science. He helped to found a three-year residence public school for gifted children in the state of Illinois. The Cuban Physics Society highly appreciates his initiative of visiting our country and his large interest in collaboration with our physicists and students that can open important new opportunities. Because of his high merits, dedication, and human solidarity, a spirit and spirit of solidarity, the Cuban Physics Society gives him the title of honored member of the Cuban Physics Society. And now, we will give, we, we will have with us the Professor Leon Lederman. Thank you very much, Victor. Usually, uh, I apologize for my ignorance of Spanish. There's no excuse for this. I've been visiting Latin America since uh, 20 years, but somehow whenever I sit down to study Spanish, some physics problem interferes, and uh, I'm still hopeful, uh, even though uh, I'm considered to be a, a senior citizen. I like rather to call myself chronologically advantaged, but um, uh, I'm going to talk about education and about the importance of education in these times. Uh, it's a, a well-known subject, and I am uh, uh, uncomfortable in education because uh, I've been teaching for all my life, essentially, uh, at Columbia University. We uh, all the professors uh, did a reasonable amount of teaching. But education itself is more than teaching. And because it's more than teaching, I'm not very comfortable with it. I know that I'm very comfortable with physics. I'm a famous physicist. But when it comes to education, I have no uh, uh, well-known qualifications. So just to illustrate this, I'll tell you a, a story that nobody knows about President Clinton visiting, uh, he made a state visit to Helsinki and in Finland. And uh, uh, he did the usual thing, he went on tour and they showed him all the wonderful things. At some point, he said to his host, I suppose the uh, 
president of Finland. He said, I would like to, uh, I brought from, from Washington flowers, a beautiful bouquet of flowers. I want to put it on the tomb of the unknown soldier. Of course, in most countries, there is a special place where there is a, a place where you bury some soldier who was killed in a war and nobody knows his name. And the president of Finland uh, said yes, just a minute, and he turned to his colleagues and he said, do we have a tomb of unknown soldier? And they said, we don't know, what is that? What is it? So one very bright physicist, a Finnish physicist who was in the party said, I know. So the whole procession with the police uh, motorcycles went across Helsinki, came to a beautiful square. In the middle of the square, it was a statue of Sibelius. Now, Clinton is very well educated, and he recognizes Sibelius. He said, that's Sibelius, a famous Finnish composer. And they said, yes, as a composer, he's famous, but as a soldier, he is unknown. <laughs> how to turn on the overhead projector. I hope you can see this. What I'm going to talk about at first, in a very broad way, is the uh, uh, purpose of school. We want to talk about education in a deep way. We have to agree on why we have schools. I mean, I don't know who invented schools. Newton invented uh, mechanics. Uh, but who invented schools? I don't know. Probably goes back before the beginnings of history. Uh, so, well, so the question is, what is the purpose of schools? Well, let's try a variety of answers. Here. So I give you a uh, an examination. What's the purpose of schools? Well, it might be that it keeps the beautiful children away from the house. <laughs> or it might be that uh, since schools need teachers, it employs people who couldn't get any other job. <laughs> or in the US, it trains McDonald's workers to make change. Or schools is something that no one is against, and President Clinton is for. Uh, it creates ethical and moral graduates who become lawyers. Or it creates executives of tobacco companies. I don't know if it came to Cuba, but there was a beautiful television picture of seven of the richest men in America who owned tobacco companies. All swearing with, on the Bible that tobacco is good for you. <laughs> and it creates scientists. Of course, we know what scientists do. They make all kinds of explosions. That's not theoretical scientists. Theoretical scientists are very different. They don't make explosions. They solve every problem by mental activity. There's two famous theoretical physicists who went in climbing in the mountains outside of Geneva, where there's a lot of physicists, and they got lost in the mountains. And that was very annoying, especially to the senior theoretical physicist, because getting lost is a stupid thing to do. So he said to his colleague, give me the map. He studied the map and used his theoretical knowledge, his wisdom, his intelligence, and a few differential equations, he said, you see that mountain over there? You know, that one over there, the tall one? That's where we are. <laughs> okay. Now I'll we'll try to find out what education is really for. And uh, if we want to make an argument, uh, we can see, make a list of problems this is not a complete list. Uh, 
and then this list was laid out uh, a few months ago, and it might have changed. But major problems facing all of society, and one, of course, has to do with uh, environment, uh, global environmental problems, and that's characterized by the fact that all, I think, 140 world leaders gathered in Rio some years ago to discuss uh, the problems of environmental, global warming, climate change, many, many such things which uh, do not respect national borders. Another problem has to do with population growth. Again, world leaders collected in Cairo, 93 or so, to discuss the common problem of populations. Another problem that I'm aware of is a growing, growing gap between rich and poor. Not only between rich nations and poor nations, I think that that gap is, is growing, but also between rich and poor people inside a country. Certainly, I think that's happening in the United States rather dramatically. The gap is increasing, and I think in, certainly in the other industrial societies, it must be happening. Then there are other new, new kinds of diseases, like AIDS and other diseases that seem to be pandemic, spread over uh, national boundaries. We've just discovered a new mosquito in the United States, or at least in New York. I don't know how it survives in New York, but uh, which is producing diseases that are unknown. It's this very common sort of thing because of the travel, the ease of travel, and so on. Then there are natural disasters, earthquakes. We've seen many examples of terrible earthquakes. We've seen terrible uh, hurricanes, Caribbean. Uh, that's natural disasters, volcanoes, uh, and also man-made disasters. We can remember the escape of uh, poison gases from a factory in uh, India, uh, which killed a thousand people. It's an incredible disaster that we can do to ourselves, oil spills, uh, that damage the environment in a terrible way. And then we have other issues like the fact that the cities, uh, certainly in, uh, uh, around the world, tend to be crowded, uh, tend to be uh, very poor in, 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 and almost neglected uh, in, in the cities, and especially in the industrial societies where the wealthy people move away from the cities and leave the cities uh, often foolishly, I think, uh, to poor people and, uh, and then forget about taking care of the cities. Uh, on a global scale, there's the destruction of biodiversity uh, due to the uh, destruction of forests, <coughs> things like that. There's limit of agricultural productivity, which is connected to population. Hey, well, you can make your own list. One of the things that interests me is the growth of anti-science. And I made an asterisk because anti-science, you can make a long list of uh, things which are connected to anti-science, like radical fundamentalists. These are people who are just the opposite of science. A fundamentalist has a rigid belief where science does not have a rigid belief, except perhaps a, a belief in rationality. But uh, fundamentalists don't believe in rationality. And that's okay, they can do that, but the trouble with radical fundamentalists is they tend to kill anybody who doesn't agree with them. That's uh, devastating. Uh, in the U.S., we have something called creation science. They're not violent, but they insist that the schools teach that the world uh, began 6,000 years ago, uh, was created that way, and all the evidence that the world is much older was put there by God confuse uh, archaeologists and everybody else. Psychics are people who uh, will read your mind or uh, read the mind of your dog. Uh, fortune tellers are people who can see the future. People who believe that if you put razor blades under a pyramid, blades can get sharper, so you don't have to buy new blades. They'll sell you the pyramid very cheaply. Uh, spiritualists who communicate with and so on and so on. Here, Israeli magicians are a good list here. Because they, they, uh, I mean, a good magician will eventually tell you how he does the trick. Israeli magicians won't tell you, they'll say they have.
special skills, uh, people who have extra sensory perception, experts. UFO is a very popular thing in, in the United States. That's unidentified flying objects. So these are uh, aliens that come to us from Mars, out of space, and they land on the Earth. They abduct American citizens, women sometimes, and they take them up in space and they sexually assault them, and then they bring them back, uh, and so on. Lots of, and people believe it. It's a worrying thing in 1999, uh, sorry, whatever it is, five or six hundred years after the Enlightenment. Okay, so what's the real purpose of schools? If you look at all of those things, you can guess that uh, at least education makes a positive contribution to minimizing those things. An educated person will ask the person who was a witness to the UFOs and say, well, what is your evidence? will demand proof, and uh, that's uh, the sign of education is skepticism. One of the things we should always teach children in school is skepticism. That's not an easy thing to do because the teacher wants the student to believe what the teacher tells them and what the parents tell them. So to try to say the children should train the skepticism is not something the teachers like and it's not something the parents like. Parents' word is truth, law, rules, and uh, there should be no question about it. And yet, sometimes there's some truth to the fact that parents have authority, but skepticism is an important element. And it's certainly in the training of scientists, but in the training of all citizens. And our objective is to create the citizens more comfortable with science. So, my definition of the purpose of schools, in my opinion, is to produce graduates of the schools, wherever they stop, who can cope. That means who can manage comfortably in the world into which they come out. And the trouble is that that world is changing. It's changing so rapidly that the world in which the students graduate is different from the world in which their parents live and the world in which their teachers live. The pace of change is enormous. Uh, and uh, that is a, a major problem. The pace of change is, as you probably know, driven by science and technology based on science. It's the technology that's changing. And I can show you many evidences of that. I think the year 2000 is not only a symbolic year generated by a calendar invented thousands of years ago by, I don't know, Romans or so on. Uh, but it's also a threshold, a kind of threshold, to a new era, which is driven by science and technology. It doesn't happen exactly on January 1, but we can see a change, a radical change, in the way we are living. And by we, I mean people who are touched by science and technology. If you're not touched by it, then you don't particularly see that change. But that change is there anyway. It's important to know that that change exists. What kind of a world is this uh, 21st century? As I said, it's not the world of parents. Uh, it's, a, it's a changed world. It's not even the world of the, of the politicians. Uh, it's a world of new language. If you listen to some uh, uh, young people talking, they might say, I'm faxing you the CD-ROM data we downloaded from the Yahoo website. <laughs> Five years ago, people would have thought you were talking some Hungarian dialect. <laughs> Yet, it makes perfect sense uh, if, you're, if you're with it. It's a world of exploding technology exponential growing knowledge base and the world is shrinking uh, because of travel, because of trade, because of the irre ir irrelevance of national borders to these disasters that we talked about. Uh, and so that's the framework of, uh, of the world. Uh, in order to understand the 21st century, we have to summarize what we learned in the 20th century, the last, say, 100 years. Uh, first of all, we learned something which scientists should know, is that in 
invest in research is profitable. And research pays. One should never feel guilty about spending money on any kind of scientific investigation. Because more or less, uh, the, uh, if you like, the gross national product of the planet Earth is enormous, and most of that increase over the last hundred years comes from technology and science-based technology. Uh, it pays back to the national treasuries something like 20 to 60 percent per year, and that is uh, uh, an opinion of economists. And economists reminds me of, of an old Soviet story in which Gorbachev was reviewing on May 1st of the May Day Parade, and there was the, uh, the, the artillery and the tanks and the soldiers, and then came a very curious group of men dressed in red uniforms with gold buttons, but instead of guns, they were carrying slides. And Gorbachev said to the marshals who were called, he says, who are those? And he said, they're the economists. And so Gorbachev says, we have economists in the Red Army. And Zukov says, yes, yes, economists can do a lot of damage. When they uh, produce studies which are useful, there's nothing wrong in quoting economists, and they will uh, assemble all the stories of how science gives rise to increased uh, economic activity and taxes paid to treasuries and so on. Oh, I use the story that 39.5% of the United States gross national product is uh, derived from science, which didn't exist 40 years ago. That's a study I can, I can uh, show to you. In order to preserve and enhance the capacity to profit from research, by profit I don't only mean financial profit, but I mean profit from the point of view of quality of life. We need a science and technology literate general public. We need public that is comfortable with science, doesn't feel as if it's cut out. The gap, the increasing gap between rich and poor, at least in my country, is driven by technology. It's the technology that's producing that gap. Because if you have access to technology, then you can profit from it. But if you have no access to the technology, then you slide backwards and further and further. So uh, that's the, uh, the problem with a with an obligation to train all students, all students, whatever their futures will be, in enough science, technology, and mathematics to uh, not only make them a literate citizenry that can engage in conversations about how the future should be in the country, but also out of that group will come even more uh, future scientists and engineers. Let me talk about the 21st century from the point of view of a physicist who thinks about these things and tries to uh, uh, analyze uh, the, the major revolutions of the 20th century. There are three you can call, talk about. One is our understanding of matter. That comes from atomic theory. It comes from the quantum theory. The quantum theory gave us a complete mastery of the atom and the molecule, and uh, therefore, it's the revolution in our understanding of matter. That generated an understanding of large, complex molecules, which we call biomolecules, and gave rise to the 1950 revolution in biology, which we call molecular biology, with perhaps the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick uh, were inspired to study DNA uh, by the quantum mechanics, especially a book by Erwin Schrodinger, one of the inventors of the quantum mechanics, called What is Life? And again, the same revolution in our understanding of matter gave rise to an understanding of semiconductors. And because we understood semiconductors, we have a computer revolution. The computer revolution is maybe even more dramatic. Uh, somewhere between these two revolutions, the world will be changing very, very dramatically already 
see the power of computers increasing to such a vast extent and expectations of even greater speed of computers and what they can do. And uh, you see the control we're beginning to get of genetics and uh, a whole uh, molecular structure which governs life. Um, anyway, uh, if we look at the DNA, I already talked about that, in which we have control of, of viruses. I have seen uh, photographs taken in a huge uh, x-ray machine of a virus attacking a cell in 50 picosecond intervals, watching the virus move towards the cell and killing the cell. And then by studying the interlocking groups of molecules that make the virus, one can do what we call rational drug design. One can design a specific drug for that particular virus. Again, by shaping the molecules in such a way as to make the virus synthetic. Internet is an incredible happening. Uh, there are now some 200 million people who use internet, probably in the next years that will go up to a million people. There are uh, 10 million websites. A tremendous uh, opportunity for entertainment, for education, for uh, increasing your knowledge, for browsing, just wandering through the internet. It's a terrible waste of use of, of your time, but uh, it has this enormous power. Of course, like any other technology, there's a dark side to internet. What we can do is a big but. All of these wonderful things, uh, we have to be cautious. We have a lot of experience with the fact that anytime you do have a technology, the technology may have surprising consequences that we didn't anticipate. Over and over again, we see examples of this. Uh, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for, for discovering vitamin C claimed that he himself felt that he was guilty of millions of deaths. And they said to him, how could you be? Vitamin C is a wonderful, simple, medicinal product. He said, yes, I said that. But, uh, during World War II, the German army was suffering from diseases which came from the lack of vegetables and fruits. Uh, they were deficient in vitamin C, so the German government produced a factory that made huge quantities of vitamin C which probably extended the war into the year. So this poor guy who invented vitamin C felt totally guilty. Just shows you how, how, how careful one has to be about the use of technology. We can't safely extrapolate the human reaction to all of this. Many people feel cut off from this technology. They feel alienated. They're not part of it, especially the age group. Most people of my age, will sit down maybe at the computer, usually with the help of their grandchildren to show them how to turn it on and be amused by it. But generally, uh, that's just an example of the uh, difficulty of uh, understanding human reactions. Also, modern science does not touch the need of humans for comfort, for hope, for inspiration. There's nothing included in modern technology that accounts for that. And we have this four or five hundred year commitment to rationality. It has brought us many blessings. Nevertheless, it is not solved. And in some cases, it has made worse the scourges of human existence, poverty, disease, population, uh, environmental menaces, and also the, the things that plague uh, human character, fear, and hatred, greed, selfishness, and so on. It's another reason, I think, for the need for scientists and university presidents, if they happen to be around, to be included with educators in shaping the education of children. I mean, all of this is to try to motivate you to say that we really need a radical change in the way we educate children. We have to somehow build into the education enough of a grasp of science, technology, and mathematics, and then along with that, the
consequences of unethical and immoral applications of these things. Somehow we have to learn to teach ethics. I don't know how to teach ethics, but uh, we're certainly actively discussing how to do this. The 21st century will most likely must see the results of information technology and global village and raise the science and technology capacity of all nations because no matter how you look at science and technology, we know that that's the road to development and that uh, therefore we, we have to pay attention to spreading the benefits of science and technology. Science is the most communal of human endeavors. Scientists have always worked together across oceans, across national boundaries, without the awareness of national ethnic, ethnic or social identities. And we have this incredible advantage and that the need to communicate between scientists is much more powerful than national boundaries. Power structures in the industrial nations are increasingly aware, this is a, in some sense helped by some intrinsic optimism, they're increasingly aware of the virtues of development and of the wealth creation power of science and technology. And we see that science is increasingly uh, a prominent topic on the front burner in national and local politics. For all these and other reasons, the gap between science rich and science poor must decrease in the coming decades. Within nations, the gap between rich and poor, often made worse by science and technology, must also diminish. And then I think every nation needs a science community to read the world science literature and to, using internet as a very great convenience, and to profit from the advances made anywhere else via journals, internet, listen to scientific gossip, and translate uh, for use by uh, their, uh, their colleagues. You know, in the 21st century, probably in the Within a couple of years, if you have access to internet, you will be able to sit in your living room and project on your screen any book that has ever been written, translated into whatever language you want. That's easy. You'll be able to watch any movie ever made uh, with the subtitles in Sanskrit or any language that you'd like to see, if not dub. Uh, you will be able to listen to any musical recording, ever recorded. Uh, these are within the capability of, of the system right now. So we're looking at a, a period of change, and therefore when we design an educational system, we have to prepare the children for unexpected events, just as a physicist uh, learns how to handle, let's say, a hype canal. Helium atom, but he should have the power to handle something that is totally new. Some uh, new kind of atom, for example, not to be. Well, it was a few years ago when I was younger, we uh, discovered that uh, uh, an atom could be made with a, with a nucleus, instead of having an electron in orbit, it could have a mu meson in orbit. Totally different kind of atom, because the mu meson particle is 200 times heavier than the electron. The solution of the equations are quite different. So just as physicists and scientists uh, always expect new things to happen and are able to apply the science, we want all children to be, expect new things to happen in their lifetimes. It's a different kind of world. Once upon a time, uh, you could look forward to having a job. Uh, maybe you're a machinist. Running late, you run that lane for 35 years, you retire, you get the gold watch and go home. Today, you know, six months after operating the lane, a new lane is moved in, which is computer control. And the guy has to learn a new kind of uh, profession, which is how to run a computer operator. That's the kind of change. I mean, now we get a little specific. Uh, <laughs> With, uh, what we're doing. I want to do two applications. But uh, before I step into the education business, I'll show you a, a kind of 
diagram, a business diagram of education, because I started going to meetings of experts on education. And I found a lot of disagreement between the experts. Some experts say the most important part of education is before the child ever gets to school. It's called preschool. And uh, cognition scientists say at age of three or four, the child is most ready to learn. So it's at home that important education takes place. Others say primary school, kindergarten through, say, eighth grade is the most important place uh, because uh, that's the beginning of formal education. Others say high school is important, which is uh, grades uh, 9 through 12, or college, which I call 12 to 16. Out of this education, so if, if you make a metaphor or, or to an electrical circuit, you say, why should I take part in this discussion? I can draw a circuit and say, if the circuit is broken any place, I get no current. So elementary electricity. Because out of this uh, school system come teachers, voters, politicians, parents, and they are subject to what I call the public understanding of science, which is television, radio, articles, uh, editorials in newspapers, museums, malls, which sometimes have displays, cereal boxes, movies, anything that can reach the general public. Uh, I'll talk a little more about these things. And then they become parents, and then their children are preschool, and you go around. So if you have an idea as to how to improve the situation in any place, you go in and you do it. You don't worry about what's the most important thing to do. So let me tell you first about an international activity. Uh, there is an organization called ICSU. It sounds like a sneeze. You say ICSU, you say Gesundheit. Uh, but it stands for the International Council of Scientific Unions. In fact, at this moment, there is a meeting in Cairo. I understand some people who are attending that. Uh, it's the General Assembly of the International Council of Scientific Unions. It's a, uh, a venerable organization. It's, uh, I've forgotten what, what year it was formed, but I think it was in the 19th. Based in Paris, and what it is 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 uh, like I belong to the American Physical Society, and here there are people from the Cuban Physical Society. We all belong to the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. That's all the physical societies in the world belong to the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. So it's a union of all physicists. There's a union of all chemists, and there are six or so unions of biologists of different kinds, and there are total. 23 unions which span uh, scientific disciplines from archaeology to zoology. And all those unions belong to the International Council of Scientific Unions. So this is a very powerful organization because, in principle, it's connected to all the scientists in the world. And I was asked to chair a committee called the Committee on Capacity Building and Science. And we had uh, our first meeting in 1994. Uh, we had uh, people from China, Japan, Indonesia, India, Brazil, Mexico, Ghana, Nigeria, France, UK, and US. And they sat around the table and we discussed, first of all, the definition of capacity. And then we debated what one must do to build the capacity of nations to become science confident so that science and associated technology can advance the development of the nation. In uh, some three uh, years of and four meetings and several working groups, we decided to focus on three components of capacity building. One was teaching of science primary schools. And I'll tell you why. What is raising the level of the public understanding of science, public science literacy. And then find another one which is looks disconnected, but is really, they're all connected, is addressing the issue of the isolation of scientists, where you have a small country and do not have a critical mass of scientists uh, because there are not enough of them. How do you address that problem? There are two kinds of isolation. 
One is a cultural isolation. That happens everywhere. Uh, I once realized this when I came out of uh, my laboratory at 7 o'clock in the morning after a long night uh, taking data, and I was very excited because we had the possibilities of a major discovery. But it was 7 o'clock, and uh, my wife called and said, stop at the grocery store and bring home some milk and bread. So I went to the grocery store. But I was excited. The first person I saw after the laboratory was the grocer. And I said to him, do you know what I did last night? And then I stopped and I realized that between us there was a, a gap, which I could not bridge without know, losing that whole day. Uh, that's the, what I mean by cultural isolation. There's too big a gap between the science community and the non-science community. And the other is the geographical isolation which must exist here in many small countries where you just don't have enough scientists who are interested in a particular field uh, and uh, the others are out there. They connect an issue and so, and mainly because they're connected by the, but we decided the primary tool for addressing these issues uh, on a world basis was internet. That internet is uh, spreading wildly wildly and widely, uh, connectivity is, is going all over the world. Our Ghana member communicated with us by email from Lopi Lopi village somewhere in the bush. He said he's not interested in the, in the uh, information superhighway. It's the information jungle track, but nevertheless it's information. So, why primary schools? Well, for many third world countries, primary school education is all there is. Uh, primary school teachers are, in general, and this I think is true everywhere I've checked, they're poorly trained in mathematics and science. Uh, usually, primary school teachers have to teach all subjects, and uh, the subjects that they're most uh, fearful of is uh, science and mathematics. Certainly true in the U.S. and in uh, the countries that were represented by that list I showed you. Also, primary schools are less culturally dependent than secondary schools, so it's easier to try to uh, make universal curriculum. You don't have to shape the curriculum to the, to the local cultures as much as you have to do that in secondary schools. And then, of course, once we are successful in primary schools, we can proceed to secondary schools. So here is the plan. It's an action plan which was approved by the General Assembly in Rixu and is sort of in the beginning, slow beginnings of implementation. What we would do would be to have a central secretariat somewhere in the world, doesn't matter where it is, uh, but uh, well equipped with uh, uh, computers and access to the internet. And this would uh, send out uh, appeals all over for the best teaching materials. And there are teaching materials in all the developed countries, and there are interesting teaching materials in underdeveloped countries because they were innovative, they, were, they had no equipment, and they, they invented ways of teaching science without equipment. And those are very important issues to, to feed in. So we get these best materials. We have a small group of experts who will do quality assurance, who will uh, take care of the translation of these materials and curriculum and then transmitted by internet to a locality where we have something which is which we call the science corps like peace corps but these are people who are some education in science they could be only uh, a bachelor's degree that would be very good uh, could be an engineer could even be a well-trained nurse anybody who has some science capability can read the information that comes off the internet, and they will intervene in the schools and train the teachers. And I'll show you a, a way of doing that in a few moments. Uh, so you get excellent, well-tested curricula for children, say, age 5 to 13. Collect, filter, translate, and transmit to the science board. And the science board intervenes with the teachers. And that's why we need public understanding of science. If you want to change primary schools, you have to convince the teachers, the parents, the school officials, uh, teachers' union, the uh, uh, local politicians.
politicians who uh, give money to the schools, and pretty soon you're talking about the entire community. So you might as well raise their uh, level uh, at the same time. And then the science core, of course, feeds back information, ideas, and problems to the secretariat. And what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about uh, what, what, uh, what brought me to that particular uh, activity, and that's the Chicago experience. So let me, let me switch to the Chicago experience. Uh, I moved into Chicago uh, in 1989 after 10 years in the suburbs of Chicago as director of Premier Level. And uh, at that time, uh, there was a lot of excitement among the uh, university people. In fact, all of the citizens of Chicago were very uh, upset about the quality of schools. Uh, some particular, I think it was the Minister of Education, the Secretary of Education, called, complained that Chicago was the worst school system in the whole country. When he said that, the people in Detroit were very upset because they thought they were the worst school. But nevertheless, the cities have very poor schools, general agreement. In Chicago, it's a huge system, 420,000 students in 540 schools. And 67% of the children were below the poverty level, official level of what we call poverty. Over, uh, over well over 50% of the kids never finish school. They drop out. Uh, they any any uh, examination, national tests, they are down at the bottom, the lowest 2% scores in national tests. Uh, over 50% of the children, English is the second language. The first languages are something like 80 different languages spoken by the children. And then there's, there's, a, there's the problem of when the child wakes up at home, and usually a poor home, and you don't know what those circumstances are, Somehow the child has to walk through dangerous streets where there are gangs and drugs. Somehow avoid those uh, difficulties and come to a school which is usually 50, 70 years old and uh, not in very good uh, repair. And they come into the classroom. And what happens is you have uh, these dropouts. If the kid drops out of school, it's going to be very hard to get a job. So you have unemployment, temptation to join gangs. Teenage pregnancy is a major problem. I think this is really, uh, to me, absolutely unacceptable in a country as rich as any of the industrial countries. Well, uh, Chicago made a big school reform. People got very upset. The parents got upset. Business people got upset. University community. And a new law was passed, which changed the way schools operate. And uh, then the question came, how could university professors, let's say scientists, help? Well, we recognize that primary school teachers, as I mentioned, are totally untrained to teach math and science. And it's too bad because children are natural scientists. That's because a good scientist is good because he or she asks good questions. So it's the asking of questions that makes the scientist, and children ask questions. So they are all scientists they begin school because they're always asking questions. The trouble is that if the teacher is busy and impatient and maybe insensitive, then uh, the child's curiosity gets crushed. And that's too bad. We want to keep that curiosity alive. So in training teachers, we make that an extremely important uh, project. Experimental programs in the 1960s uh, show that if taught in the right way, science and math can engage children and resonate with their natural curiosity. Science for five, six, and seven-year-olds can open the door to the joy of all learning. We find that children who do the right kind of science in fifth grade, and there's a lot of research on this now, do better in all the other subjects. So the revolution is one in which this means forbidden. Teacher is lecturing to the students. The students are sitting rigidly in, in chairs, which usually nail them to the floor, uh, and they listen quietly to the teacher. Or they don't listen quietly; they fight or ignore it. The, 
in the U classroom, there are five or six tables, four children around each table, and they're working. They're doing research. They're doing experiments. I'll tell you a little bit about the experiments. Some of them are fighting. Some of them are asking the teacher questions. And the teacher will often say, I don't know the answer to that question. Let's go and find out. And that's unheard of. We, uh, we had a, a, friend, a French educational system came to Chicago and did a videotape uh, of our classroom. And one of the things they concentrated on was this little uh, vignette with Little girl asked the uh, uh, teacher a question, and the teacher said, I don't know the answer. The French were absolutely astonished that the teacher would say, I don't know the answer. And the teacher and the student would walk to the corner of the room where there's a small a telephone, a modem, uh, some of the books, and try to find out the answer together. The teacher, in this case, is a learner. So we organized in Chicago. Uh, Teachers Academy for Mathematics and Science. Um, it's called TAMS. We opened in the summer of 1990. Uh, we got all the universities in Chicago, 14 universities, uh, to collaborate to officially organize this TAMS. Uh, we got money from the state of Illinois. We got money from the National Science Foundation. We got money from the Department of Energy. I was very good at raising money for the Department of Energy because I was the director of the largest laboratory. My budget was $200 million a year. And I called them up and I said, I need $100,000. They said, who is this? Letterman, though, can't be Letterman. $100,000. You know, I was at a new scale of uh, financing. The objective of, uh, of TAMS is to train teachers who are currently teaching in the Chicago schools. There are 24,000 teachers, something like that, in the Chicago schools, and teach them both science, mathematics, and the correct pedagogy of science and mathematics. And the pedagogy, method of teaching science and mathematics, is undergoing a revolutionary change due to uh, an increasing understanding of how children learn called cognition science. Uh, children learn uh, by constructing uh, a scenario for the process that they're trying to understand. It's called an inquiry method, sometimes it's called hands-on. The French version now that is copying Chicago being called uh, the pot à la main, which means hands to the test in French. Uh, it's an active way. Children are active. They're doing things. And in the early grades, what you teach is not so much the facts of science, but how science works. I'll give you some examples. But let me give you the strategy. Uh, here we say 18,000 things. That's primary school. The primary school has about 18,000 teachers, and most of them are totally untrained in math and science. So we bring them out of the classroom. We bring in uh, substitutes, young uh, people who may have bachelor's degree in science, retired teachers, some professors who would like to do this sort of thing, and uh, we bring the teachers to us and we give them some 130 hours of math, then a hundred and equivalent amount of science, and about 50 hours of computers, technology. Uh, we also include the parents, we include the uh, principal in this process. We include community groups that live near the school. Uh, we, we include non-teaching staff. We try to get everybody living in the school, near the school, to be involved in this process. It's called systemic. We're changing the entire system. We're changing it in a radical way. Let me give you a couple of precise examples. Uh, it's early. At Fermilab, the process in which somebody does research at Fermilab is to write a proposal, along with a bunch of colleagues, you send the proposal in to the laboratory manager. He has a committee that reads the proposal. If it's approved, the first thing you do is you, uh, you make an outline of the experiment, then you collect the data, then you analyze the data, organize it in some sensible way, and then you look at the data and make conclusions. 
conclusions. So we use that pattern for these children, even five-year-olds. For example, here's a five-year-old uh, kindergarten before regular school. It's called Granddad Candy. So what you have is a large bowl on the teacher's desk filled with jelly beans. They're just little candies of different colors. So each each uh, group of three of them and the, the students form a, uh, a lot of collectives. Four kids together make a collective. They work together as a team, and they take a uh, they gather together some 30 or 40 of these jelly beans, they bring it to their table, and they organize the data, they've collected the data, they've organized it into colors, these reds, blues, greens, oranges, and so on. Uh, then they, uh, then they, uh, when they finish that, that, these children in kindergarten cannot uh, subtract. Subtraction is still ahead, so what they, but they can count. So they ask questions like, how many more reds than blues? So that's easy, they just draw a line and they count the surplus reds. So they can answer a lot of questions in that kind. Then they can ask, answer deeper questions, like uh, if you were blindfolded, what is the chance of getting a purple jelly? Well, they're very purple jelly. So they look at their data, they look at their data and their colleagues on the next table. Anybody have a purple jelly bean? One in the whole class. So the chance of getting uh, a, a purple jelly bean is small. You know, we're teaching them probabilities, but only in the very beginning stages. Another, and so they do many experiments of this kind. Another experiment is uh, the lifetime of soap bubbles. So we talk about soap bubbles. Somehow the children and the teacher make a conversation before the experiment. And each kid gets uh, some detergent. Could be a commercial detergent, various kinds. And you can see which detergent has better soap bubbles. And uh, then they blow bubbles with a little wire, uh, and they throw bubbles on each other and play for a while. And then the teacher says, "Okay, let's go." So they take, they make, uh, they blow a bubble, they catch it in the little wire hoop, and they start a stopwatch. And the bubble breaks, they stop the watch, and they count three seconds. They do this 30 or 40 times, each time recording the, how long the bubble lived, the collecting data, and they organize the data. How many bubbles live between 0 and 1? How many bubbles live between 1 and 2? And they draw a table, and then they graph it. We try to get them, teach them graphing very early. So they graph the lifetime of the soap bubble. And that's, uh, then they can answer questions like, what's the average? Well, we don't normally you took average, but if, you know, if you had a random bubble, what's the most probable lifetime? Let's say seven seconds. What's the chance that a bubble will live 20 seconds? So the kids discuss this, they look around the other tables. Only one kid has a bubble that lasted 19 seconds. So they say 20 seconds is not possible, but it's uh, improbable. So again, you're know, learning something about distribution. We do a lot of things with linearity. Take a, uh, uh, a piece of cardboard that uh, uh, paper uh, wraps around toilet paper or kitchen paper, kitchen towels, and you look at a meter stick, which is scotch tape to a blackboard. You go a certain distance away, and you see how much of the meter stick you can see. You vary D, and you see what the uh, what this is. So it's an independent variable and an independent variable bouncing ball, and many, many such examples of linearity, process in science. And then little by little, as they get to fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, we teach them facts of science. But facts always in the context of things you do with your hands. This is fantastically successful. The one thing children love, they're orderly, watch themselves, and finish up uh, in a minute or two. Uh, it's a powerful tool for learning and playing at the same time. So these kids become committed to the science and the teachers love it. And the teachers never knew this before. And of course we have to teach the teachers in much more depth than the children. Okay. So we do, we've been doing this for 10 years with a lot of uh, effort. And uh, the net result is, as you might guess, uh, the state of Illinois gives the same test to all children in second grade, fourth grade, sixth grade. And these kids, or in some of the poorest schools and the 
most unpleasant neighborhoods are beginning to uh, catch up to the state averages. Uh, it's a remarkable set of data that shows that, this, that the teachers are excited and interested in the subject, that the children will catch on and also become addicted to the learning of science. Uh, maybe in another 10 years, some of these kids will win high pride crazy, uh, prizes in science, and we'll know more about it. Uh, it's incidentally not very costly, but we do have to spend a certain amount of money per teacher. In fact, uh, I would say it's not cheap. Uh, we spend about $3,000 per teacher per year, and we have to stay with the teacher. It's not quick. We stay with the teacher and the school for somewhere between three and four years. So it's as if we're giving each teacher, this is the cost of a, of a master's degree, if you like, in uh, medium-cost universities. But uh, it pays. Every dollar you spend on teacher education and teacher improvement uh, pays back uh, in the quality of the education. And as I said, the program really works. And it was that experience in, in uh, very poor schools in Chicago that made me believe that this could work anywhere uh, if, if there were uh, a coherent plan. So I think the the major lesson I want to just draw is sort of what can I say, what can physicists do, but this is what can scientists do. And I think scientists have a responsibility to get involved with the school system, the local schools, especially if they have children in the schools. Don't leave it to the teachers. Just find out how good the instruction is, how well trained the teachers are, and if they're not trained well enough, then you've got to see to improving that situation. And as I say, internet is sooner or later will be uh, as common as the telephone or the television set. And then again, propaganda, writing articles and letters for local newspapers about science. There's an interesting thing happening in the United States. If you are supported in your research by the National Science Foundation, so the pony set, uh, every article you publish, say, in Physical Review, must be accompanied by an article, we say in English, an article that anybody can understand about your work, translation of your work into common everyday language. And that's a very good thing because it gives the physicists practice in, in popularizing. Uh, again, I think there are lots of, lots of things that can happen, and I don't think that it will happen unless the scientists have a bigger understanding of this. Uh, play a role. So my final chart is a quotation from uh, <clears throat> the brain futurist H.G. Wells way back in 1922, which is 77 years ago, said human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. Thank you.
the doubt that there are materials they exist in the United States, and there's no question that we can get those materials here. How do we collect the teachers? Okay. How do we collect the teachers? We go to a school. The school is the unit of change. We go to the principal. He knows we're coming. We fall on the first. Uh, we meet with him. We talk with him. We have. We. I mean, there's a special group in our in our uh, community. Uh, of, uh, we call it the community group. They visit the school, they try to understand the vision of the principal, the leader, the headmaster. Then they interview all the teachers in the school, 30, 40 teachers in the school on the average, to find out what their science background is. Uh, so they, and they get a, a profile. They try to interview parents, and often in this inner city, their community groups, uh, which are of a particular ethnic makeup. Uh, an Afro-American group will have a community group that's interested in the schools from their point and so on. There's a Hispanic and so on. And so we, we get a picture of the school from them those visits. Then we make a proposal to the school on the basis of that information. And uh, we make a memorandum of understanding. Now the school is going to be with us for three or four years. In fact, often five or six years. In the later years, we don't, we're not so active. And then we make an arrangement where we can bring the teachers to us. We're, we're situated right in the middle of the city of Chicago. Slightly dangerous, uh, but uh, so it's easy for the teachers to get to us. And we have to train substitutes. And sometimes we'll take the teachers on weekends or late afternoon after school is over. And some try to use all the time we can to create these teaching opportunities for teaching teachers. So we're trying to raise the level of teachers to a good level. And then now I think it's lifetime. We believe teachers must learn all the time. And they must have time to learn. So all of the officials that are responsible for schools are going to have to come up with money so that teachers can have time to become better teachers. Very satisfied that there's good evidence that this really 
really counts. I used to have a kid in my class, and 
not by my legs, she popped my legs. I remember there was a lady, and she said, Did you ever see Adam? So I explained what you see, and the evidence, and the x rays. She says, No, I don't want to know. Did you ever see Adam? She kept saying that. So I asked her if she ever saw President Clinton. She goes, Yeah, he was on television. I said, What? Television? What's that? Look at the back of the television. Anyway, but you can win an argument, but you have to understand abstraction. Well, I would bet that in Cuba, 10 years from now, kids will be looking at atoms and molecules, simulation, uh, imaging on television screen. And not only that, but if they try to take, uh, say, a hydrogen atom away from the molecule, the force will be reflected on the mouse and it will, will activate your hand. So you'll, these kids using computers will have an experience of atoms and molecules. Uh, which will be as almost as direct as, as if you can see them in your office. So I think that uh, that abstract idea will go away. And, uh, technology will have a powerful effect on education in due time. The nice thing about computers is they can get it cheaper. You can eat computers with the sheet. Yeah. Minnesota, CERN, they're moving from Geneva to 
old long tunnel somewhere in the So uh, those experiments, they only took me a couple of years before those experiments have results. Other than that, I don't think there's any evidence. There's some indicators from the experiment of Los Alamos for some oscillation, but it's not convincing yet. No, not yet. I have not seen a publication which people say yes. The group itself is very hesitant, and I must say I don't I haven't heard anything about it in the last six months or so. So I don't know about those